Hello and welcome back to Victoria on Relay FM. I'm Quinn Rose and I did go to art school, but I love learning about art anyway. And I'm Betty. I also didn't go to art school, but I also really love learning about art and walking around museums a lot. And it turns out I walked around a museum um, looking at some art this past Friday. Which museum did you go to? So I went to the Museum of Fine Art in Boston. Um, As I mentioned in the last podcast episode, if I believe, or the one before, one of them, um, if those of you who tuned into that one, um, I now live in Boston. (laughs) One of us. One of us. Yeah. I'm not not American yet. It takes a while for that to happen. And one still, of us. <laughs> like, still unsure if that's the route I'm going, but it's a nice place so far. Uh, so uh, I went to a special exhibition that's on right now. It's called Turner's Modern World. It's from March 27th to July 10th, 2022. And it is about, um, or it's an exhibition that features the artwork of the um, British artist J.M.W. Turner, um, who lived in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Have you heard of this person, Quinn? I sure have. Oh, yeah. I feel like Boston really loves Turner. (laughs) Yeah. That's just kind of the vibe that I get. I feel like he's like a favorite of sort of the whole Boston vibe. (laughs) Because Boston's very into the whole... uh, colonial history thing i guess is what i would call this because there was so much going on in terms of like the revolutionary war era that's not that's not like exactly what turner's deal is but i just still feel like they have the same energy to me and that there's like that turner's art just shows up a lot in boston in my brain yeah for me it's like it's everywhere i turn it's either history or it's a dunkin donuts (laughs) <laughs> which i really like by the way because it we basically we have our version of dunkin donuts is tim hortons so basically i just replaced tim hortons with dunkin donuts and it's working out so far they, they're basically the same thing yeah exactly so anyway enough but this episode is not about dunkin donuts it does seem like turner is a pretty big deal and one of the works I'll be talking about today is in the MFA's collection, and it's like one of his most famous works. I don't even know if it's the famous. It might be, but we'll, we'll get into it later. Um, but a thing about this particular exhibition that I think is a little bit different than previous Turner shows that I've seen, because um, we actually had a Turner show at the AGO a number of years ago, which I actually um, did the tour for the show, so I kind of knew you know, a bit of a background of the biography of Turner. But this particular show, like, as I mentioned, it's called Turner's Modern World. So it really focused on, like, why Turner is a modern artist. And not only a modern artist, it kind of makes the argument that he, like, pioneered modernism, or at least, like, Western modernism, as we know it today. Like, he's, he's, considered by a lot of art historians the first modern artist based on what you know like have you heard this about him and like what do you know about him um based on what you've heard my understanding of turner is that he does a lot of paintings of ships that's the main thing that i've got he does a lot of very pretty paintings of ships and harbors And I haven't heard about his association with the modern art movement um, and this argument. I do, I think the stuff that I've seen of him, his has been more on the realistic side, but I also know that he's got a lot of like beautiful skies and sort of very um, evocative paintings of, of skies over the ocean kind of thing. So I can definitely, even from the stuff that I've seen in my memory, I can definitely see where this conversation might be headed in that direction yeah for sure yeah he so yeah his his works definitely like it spans from yeah like highly representational to quite abstract but yeah like the interesting thing is so he did he was born in 1775 so that was actually the one year before america was america i just realized wow um (laughs) So, so close to being born the same year as the United States of America. So, you know, and he he painted and lived sort of around the early 1800s. So I guess like when I think of modernism, I don't think 230 years ago. Like that seems 
like very old to me. Uh, but the thing is, like, of course, like he because he's kind of considered someone who's like pioneering a style. He's one of the earliest people who's quote unquote modern. It kind of makes sense, but like, you wouldn't normally associate someone who's painting in like 1805 a modern artist. Would you agree? Yeah, that is a bit surprising to me. The gist of Turner, uh, I'll kind of go through it quickly and then we'll go through a bit of his biography and then we can talk about like why he's considered so modern. Um, but a particular part of his life is he lived through quite a tumultuous period of global change. Um, so he lived through the French Revolution um, and the, the Napoleonic Wars. And there's also a lot of like expansion of the British empires. There was the abolition of slavery in the B British colonies. And so and he also saw change really rapid changes of the Industrial Revolution. So really, when it comes to modernism in in the sense of like technology and industry you could like a lot of people do argue that this was a time when things became more modern because there was a steam engine there's like factories and trains and steamships so the world especially britain was modernizing in terms of technology and he like for instance you mentioned he painted a lot of ships and that's a part of as a part of him depicting modernism he was painting like ships like steam steamships also trains and he also did paint like factories and basically just a lot of industry th that was going on in britain and i think he he was actually commissioned by a bunch of people who owned like businesses and industries to to paint i don't know their factories or their trains or something probably for commercial promotion i'm not sure um so like so he he did he did do a lot of that so the one of the one part of the argument of why he is considered modern um is that he literally painted like modern subject matter uh, but that's not the that's not the only reason but on the surface that is one argument or one level of of why he's modern but it doesn't necessarily mean he painted these factories and trains and ships in styles that we would associate with modernism at least not in the beginning uh, but that's one aspect of it and then but the other aspect is he did uh, kind of have a quite an innovative and ahead of his time style in terms of the way he painted and his brushwork. So a lot of historians, uh, art historians would say that he was, his work was kind of the inspiration behind impressionists in the, uh, like in the late 19th century, so late 1800s, early 1900s, as well as abstract expressionists who were working in the mid 20th century. So uh, that is an argument for why he like is connected to the modern art movement. But yeah, so like he did well in his lifetime. So unlike I think we oh actually on our special we talked about Van Gogh and how he was not successful in his lifetime. Uh Turner was someone who was very successful in his lifetime. He was a part of the Royal Academy, uh which is this very prestigious art institution in 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 Britain. Um and he sold a lot of his artworks. As I mentioned, he had a lot of commissions from like business people. Uh, he did exhibit quite widely in his lifetime. Um, but at the same time, <clears throat> a lot of his contemporaries and a lot of people at the time did, did think he was, especially later in his life, his later works uh, were kind of like, this guy's nuts. This is, this is weird. <laughs> we're not used <laughs> to this. Um, so part, some of his works were not well received at the time, but would also later to, you know, uh, would also be appreciated at a later time. That's so interesting to think of Turner being considered avant-garde <laughs> in any way, because in my head, he's just such this classic, famous artist. But I guess that does make sense on two levels. One, like all the stuff that you're talking about of um, both his subject matter and his style pointing towards the direction of modern art um, and being an inspiration for some of those artists who are more associated with the modern art movement. But also, it makes sense in a way that I'm more familiar with his more 
traditional representational paintings and less familiar with the ones, probably some that we're going to see today, I assume, um, that are a little bit more out there, which may have received more recognition uh, in later years, but probably still aren't what he's best known for or like seems to most often represent his work. Yeah, I certainly don't, yeah, don't associate Turner with being avant-garde, but at the time or a certain, certain, um, or some of his work were considered quite out there. Um, yeah, so I think I, I will start with kind of chronologically uh, with his life um, and some of the uh, how he got into painting and um, his career uh, because it again it's connected to the events that he witnessed throughout his life um, at which inspired a lot of his a lot of his works. Yeah, so he was um he was born um into a actually a lower middle class family um in London, but he um he actually started painting quite young and he actually was um he entered the London's Royal Academy as a student in 1789 when he was only 14. Wow. Um yeah, that and which is like it's like I think the most pre- prestigious art academy in the country, as far as I know, like at the time, um, that also happens to be the year the French Revolution began. Obviously, he's in Britain, so but we'll talk about later how that did affect, um, well, the world. <laughs> like, um, but but uh, also Turner. Let me just show you right now. Um, I think if you click on the first, um link in the show notes that will bring you to one of the paintings he did I think just a year or two after he entered the Royal Academy so he was 16 when he painted this (laughs) if you would like to describe what you are looking at I am looking at a painting it's in landscape um, and the background of the painting is the front of a series of buildings it's like one of those streets where all the buildings are connected the sort of center focus of the photo is this large kind of gray building and then in front of the building sort of pouring out of it there are all of these people Um, some of them have these buckets of water that they're pouring over stuff in the front or like getting water out of um spigots is that the word (laughs) i think so (laughs) yeah but generally there's just like people milling about um all in front of this building and it seems like if you look it that you can see just a little bit into the building and it does look like there might be some amount of smoke coming out of it from the back all of the colors are quite muted like most of the painting is kind of like gray light brown um not no bright colors really to be seen here yeah, and would you say the the work is um, pretty like real realistic in terms of representation? Oh, absolutely. This is definitely a very realistic painting. Not really seeing much experimentation in terms of abstraction. Like I mentioned, he did paint this at sixteen. Which, like, when I read that, I was like, "I'll just go home now." <laughs> like, <I> mean, <laughs> so, um, but um, <clears throat> yeah. So he painted this when he was 16 and it was actually after he witnessed a fire that destroyed uh, this building called the Pantheon Opera House in London Um, and so it was you know it's based on a real scene that he saw Um, and he painted this picture of uh, of of a real life event uh, which is something that he would continue to do uh, in the future Um, but like you mentioned this one it's it's very it's very formal um it seems like it it really is very similar to probably what you would expect to see at the royal academy or like what other artists would have been painting like so um he really like this work he is abiding by you know this like traditional classical um artistic rendering style and uh, with pers- like correct perspectives in terms of architecture and people and um you know and it, it, i think you know i think it looks really nice it's a really nice painting but really in terms of 
I, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, there's not much that's like really special about this painting. Again, it's really well done and it's really like, like he's obviously a very good, a very good artist in terms of like his technique, but there isn't really anything that's like especially innovative with, with this painting. But again, he was 16. So yeah, like if I was walking in a gallery and I saw this, it wouldn't really make me stop throughout this time like he would he would paint a combination between like picturesque landscapes of uh, places that he saw as well as historic buildings like so you can kind of see in this one like he's painting uh, buildings and then he's also uh, he like he, he was traveling around I think Britain at the time uh, but a little bit uh, a few years later he would actually travel around Europe and he actually so there's this thing that a lot of european artists do um like these you know young men what they would do like is they would do this thing called the grand tour where they would like travel all around europe going to these like classical sites he did this before there was widespread um like steam uh engine train travel so he actually uh traveled like on the back of a horse wagon Basically, what he saw, like, on the road would have been very, uh, just, like, beautiful nature and countryside. And, like, he saw this continent just before, like, the Industrial Revolution, basically. So he saw these landscapes that were not necessarily completely untouched, but, like, quite, um, like, relatively in their original state, like, natural state, I guess I would say. And that will become important because a lot would change, like, in in the ensuing decades. Um, and what k- kind of was interesting is, like, his landscapes, um, especially the ones he did on watercolors, which I'll show you some examples of in a bit, um, would become kind of nostalgic for people because they were, they would have, they would be seeing these like mountains and, you know, lakes and skies. And, but a lot of these scenes, like they wouldn't be there anymore. um, And people kind of would be drawn to them. I think uh, we talked about something similar a number of episodes about how the Florida highwaymen were depicting these like backcountry in Florida that also weren't um, around anymore by the time people were buying these paintings. And again, there was there's this like nostalgia for these types of scenes, and it's like one of the reasons why this type of paint these types of paintings kind of became popular among like people in general and also collectors. So that's that's just one of the reasons why mo- why like Turner kind of like during even during his lifetime became pretty successful. Yeah, I mean, we talk now about how rapidly technology is changing and the, the last couple of decades has been such a rapid change of technology and in a lot of ways, a rapid change of the way that humans interact with the earth and build on the earth and like all of these different kinds of things. But there's definitely a lot of parallels to be drawn with this exact time that you're describing that Turner was coming up in and the amount of rapid change that happened in his lifetime in terms of industrialization. I could definitely see how being able to represent the past and as well as some of those changes and looking towards um, all of these different things that were going on would strike a chord with people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then uh, we're not going to go over too much uh, of some of these other paintings, but basically the next two, the next two paintings I have in the show notes, uh, one is called um, the interior of the Cannon Foundry. That's an example of um, like the inside of a factory that he, he that he painted. Um, I think this one. Yeah, this one was a watercolor. He did. A, he did a lot of watercolors. Um, so in the I think it was the late 1700s or early 1800s watercolor as a medium was I think like either invented or perfected I'm not exactly sure but it basically became viable for him to take uh, watercolors with him on these trips and watercolor unlike oil it dries really quickly so you can actually go outside paint something and have it dry within like 10 minutes maybe even less and put it away and go keep going and sketch even more so he you know it was it's a very portable medium um but i don't know if like you've ever worked with watercolor but i have tried it is incredibly difficult to work with because it's so like 
just hard to control. And be, like because I've walked with, worked with watercolor, like when I see just his level of control with watercolor and how he's able to paint with it, I'm just like how like like how do you do this obviously there's a reason he's famous and talented but still (laughs) like um in this exhibition they they had a lot of his watercolors which um is also i'm also very impressed just with the fact that um his these works are like over two sorry are over 200 years old and how the fact that a lot of these watercolors survived this long is also very impressive (laughs) That's a another win for technology. Yeah. Um and then the next one um I uh in the in the show notes I just wanted to show you for a couple reasons. Um one um it's another example of him kind of painting modern life. So it's this painting with um a bunch of blacksmiths arguing. So again, he's depicting blacksmiths, like people who are um, like working in the industry and their everyday lives. But the other thing is the title of this painting, which he gave, it's not even his longest title, but it's called A Country Blacksmith Disputing Upon the Price of Iron and the Price Charged to the Butcher for Shoeing His Pony. This man titles paintings like Fall Out Boy. <laughs> Yeah, so he, he, Britain was pretty much at the war front for for most of his life. So there was the War of 1812, uh, which uh, was a war between Britain and the United States. Um, And then there was also the Napoleonic Wars, which was from like the late 1700s until 1815. Um, He himself like never fought in the war, um, but it was something that was... I guess like in the news, you know, even the, the news back then traveled a lot slower than today, but it is, it's, it is something that he was aware of and he was actually very interested in. He was really interested in like military conflicts. Um, and it ended up, uh, becoming a lot of parts of his artworks. So he initially started the way he, he was painting. It was almost like he was glorifying war, although it's not entirely clear. But the more time went on, the more it became obvious that he was showing like the horrors of war. Like this is like he was making social commentary on war itself, basically. And an example of that is um, the fourth one in the show notes um, that I have is um, called the Field, Field of Waterloo, uh, which was a... Um, depiction of the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, um, where Britain and Prussia defeated France. So um, again, so this one, I think it is, yeah, it is one of his early earlier ones, I believe. Um, and uh, it, I think this one is like one of his, I think one of his famous works. Um, but he will have another work that he painted later on of Napoleon, uh, which is quite a different context as this one. I'll show you that later on yeah this one is very dark very grim yeah painting like battles and wars and current events uh was something that he uh really liked doing uh but one of the other things he uh was that was also a subject matter of his uh was actually the independent state of venice so venice which is a part of italy now but at the time was an independent state he traveled to venice multiple times in his life and he it was one of the it was one of the places that he he painted a lot and like as this Venice is one of those examples where every trip you go on, you can see, like, if you compare his works of Venice from the first time he went to the last time he went, you can see an evolution of his style. Uh, so this uh, one I have in the show notes called Venice, the Bridge of Size is one of the ones from um, 1840. So I think in this one, um, uh, actually, yeah, if you want to describe what you see and in this one and talk about how you like comparing this one to that other the one that we saw of um the the opera house that burned down and what differences you see in terms of his style between that and this one so the bridge of size is a very interesting painting um you have in the background a fairly realistic depiction of venice i would say you know you have you have some buildings with these columns and you have the actual bridge it's like basically just the left of the center of the painting 
And then um, in the canals itself, on the left side, you have a few different people in gondolas. And then on the right side, there's a very interesting artistry here. It's basically this whole big mishmash of boats and people, and it's very abstracted. It's unclear where one starts and one ends. Um, even on the left side, like it's it's as if the paint is smudged and pulled down from itself. Um, and so, like the the so the paint of these forms is like drawn out into almost like the pseudo shadow of itself on top of there being this general uh, mixing together and abstraction of these forms and then so just comparing it to this like very early work it's interesting because there are you could i think that it still does seem like the same artist there is a similar color palette there's a similar kind of sensibility and the kind of things that he's depicting um you still have this like very detailed depiction of architecture still stands out to me but there's just so much more style now there's so much more personality in this painting um and there even though it is a very similar color palette there there's something about it that is much deeper um he is using some reds and some much darker colors in certain spots to pull focus to those and he's really trying to say something with how he's using color instead of just realistically depicting a scene for sure. And for me, like, it almost feels like there's, um, like, the scene is alive and there's movement in it. Like, when you have the breaststrokes, um, like, almost, like, dancing a little bit. Like, the people, the first one, it's, like, almost as if, or the one that we saw earlier when he painted, the one he painted when he was 16, it's, like, okay, you take a picture of someone and they're, like, very still. Whereas this one, like, I get the sense that there's like there's people moving and there's boats rowing back and forth, even though we're looking at a still image of like a painting. Yeah, absolutely. These are just a couple more examples of how he became really abstract. Like you, you can kind of see where, um, uh, like why people are saying he's kind of associated with impressionism and abstract expressionism at this point um, in his career. Yeah, man, especially the snowstorm painting. When I look at this, I can feel the movement of this water. Like, I feel like this is scratching my brain in a certain way. I feel like I am moving towards this boat. I feel like this water is choppy around me. I don't know what it is, but this has the most movement of any still frame I've ever seen. I when I was there, um, I did I did watch uh, like another video clip of a expert talking about uh, his work, and he compared the snowstorm painting to um, a Joan Mitchell painting. Actually, the I didn't get it. It was he went so fast. I didn't write down which Joan Mitchell painting, but really it could be any of them. Um, and so th like it, it's not necessarily like Joan Mitchell wasn't painting you know, like seascapes, like she was painting like abstract thoughts in her head. But in terms of the movement and the dynamism and the brushstrokes, when he put the two paintings by side by side, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. Hey, that's a really cool comparison. Yeah, exactly. So anyway, call back to also another episode <laughs> where we talked about Joe Mitchell. Anyway, so yeah, so moving kind of moving on from these uh, paintings. Uh, so the one that was kind of like front and center in this show, uh, but and most likely because this particular work is a part of the MFA's collection. Uh, it's known as Slave Ship, but the full title, again, as Turner named it, was Slavers Throwing Overboard the Dead and Dying Typhoon Coming On. So very literal. So of course, um, you will know what it's about just from the title, but if you would like to also describe what you are seeing... Wow, this painting is really interesting. So this is another seascape. Shout out to Rembrandt. But no, this is <laughs> this is another seascape and it's another stormy seascape. You have this movement of water and it's the I would say the, the focal point that my eyes are drawn to immediately when looking at this painting 
is the sunset in the background because those these are these yellows and oranges and reds and like much brighter colors than the rest of the painting and it the, the sunset is quite beautiful and so I'm immediately drawn to that and then it takes me a second to look at the rest of the painting where you have this ship that's mostly in the background and then in the foreground of the painting there are these stormy seas and you have to kind of look closer it takes you a second and then you realize that there are people in the sea and there you don't see like a whole form you mostly see hands arms legs you see the chains attached to their limbs as they're grasping out it's quite an evocative painting and it's also a deeply tragic painting. It does not, it makes it very clear and present how horrific this is. And even the, the positioning of the ship, I think, is very deliberate as well, is that the, the ship is clearly already quite some distance away from these people and is clearly heading away from them um, and leaving all these people to die after murdering them. When I first saw this painting, it was at the Turner Show at the AGO a number of years ago, and I hadn't seen it before. And what uh, was really striking to me is when you first look at it, you your your eyes quite often are drawn to the dazzling sunset in the background, and I'm like, oh, that's so pretty. And then I'm like, oh, oh, oh my god, okay, yeah, um, it is not a pretty painting, no. At all. <laughs> so. Um, and so it's depicting this incident from 1781 of a sl slave ship called Zong. And it's where the ship's crew, they murdered 132 sick and dying enslaved Africans and then threw them, or actually not and then, by throwing them overboard. Like most of them are still alive, but when they were thrown overboard and some of them would have been like eaten by the fish, as you can see in the foreground of this painting. Um, and it was pretty much because the people were at this time considered cargo and the crew uh, wanted to collect the insurance money for those lost at sea. Th this particular incident was one of the incidents that uh, contributed to the outcry, you know, to, uh, to that kind of galvanized ab abolition, abolitionism. Britain ended up abolishing slavery 40 years after that incident, so in 1832. And uh, Turner did end up painting this after slavery was already abolished in Britain, not in a lot of other parts of the world, of course. Um, and he he was obviously still demonstrating the horrors of slavery and what and something that continues to persist around the globe not only during his time, but still to this day. Um, that's one thing, you know, I, that really I did learn when I f saw this work of Turner's a few years ago, but even um, it, I was reminded of it, seeing it at this show, like, you know, slavery is still something that goes on today in the world, um, which a lot of people don't realize. Uh, but in any case, it, it definitely was um, uh, something that was still quite prevalent in a lot of in a lot of the world um, back then as well. And he was um, like this, you know, this painting makes it pretty obvious what his stance on, <laughs> uh, what what his stance was. Um, but of course, yeah, when it was first exhibited back in the 1840s, um, it still kind of, you know, it was quite a controversial piece. A lot of people were very like, like shocked, obviously, but um yeah, there was like there was a lot of uh, controversy around it uh, at the time, um, but it actually eventually came into uh, the um, possession of a young um, art critic uh, called uh, John Ruskin, and he actually was also quite influential, um, a, a quite influential art critic, um, and he eventually uh, sold it uh, to the first president of the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in 1872, and then it eventually uh, was then sold into the Museum of Fine Arts, and that's how uh, it ended up in America, basically. Um, this painting, I think, it's it I think it really shows how this style of Turner's like how he, the dynamic movements of his brushstroke like it really expresses I think what he was trying to express in in this work because I think if you 
if he painted this or if anybody painted this in a very like highly realistic way, I don't think it would express like the same movement and obviously the same like emotions this painting gives. Yeah, that's exactly the word I was going to use that it's it is still representational and that he's painting a depiction of this event, but he's also painting the emotions into it, not just attempting to create a photograph. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the only other thing um, uh, I did kind of want to mention on a lighter note, uh, maybe, about uh, Turner uh, was that uh, so he he got into the Royal Academy when he was very young, um, when he was 14, and he continued to exhibit uh, in the Royal Academy. Um, but yeah, as time went on, he kind of... Um, uh, pe- like people thought he became more and more like wild, like he obviously did in terms of his style, but he also did in terms of like just his personality and actions in a way. Um, so he, um, uh, there was this uh, thing that uh, the Royal Ac- the Royal Academy did every year when they were exhibiting uh, their works is when artists. Uh, when artists hang their paintings, they actually have a few days to put finishing touches on it when sorry, when the paintings are already on the walls. And that's usually when people are putting like a finishing coat and maybe some like touch ups. Um, but he what what it is, is like his painting would be almost like not even started or like there would just be a rough sketch and he would hang it up. And the people who are running the show were really worried and were like, um, tomorrow we're opening the exhibition. Like what is this? (laughs) So, so what he would do is in the final hours before the show, he would show up with a bucket of paint and brushes, sometimes a mop apparently, and just like start performing to a point where people would show up to watch him perform basically like it's not just painting anymore and he would just be like throwing paint on the canvas like swishing back and forth and grabbing a mop and putting the finish on it because it's so last minute um I mean like I I don't know like you know if what the reason is I don't know if he like he purposely put on a show because he thought it was interesting or if, if he was just like oh crap I need to get this done like so, so, I mean, it just made me think, I'm like, but yeah, it reminds me of me in my university days, like hours before a project. <laughs> but in this case, <laughs> he's a famous guy displaying at the most pre- prestigious academy and I'm just turning in homework. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Same energy, different results. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, people consider him, thought he was acting really weird at the Royal Academy. Um, they, you know, he, he kind of became more and more eccentric. And uh, unfortunately, he, um, I guess I sort of became a bit of a social outcast because people were just like, oh, this guy's just turning into like a crazy old man, splashing paint all over the place um, and painting with a mop, which I guess one could see why that would be a little bit odd. Um, but anyway, so um, yeah, so he became like quite uh, reclusive and uh, he, uh, for a while, um, he, I think, lived um, by himself in a studio, but he did eventually um, have a long-term uh, relationship uh, with this woman called um, Sophia Carolyn Booth. Um, and I don't believe they were ever married Um but they they did live together in her house in Chelsea for um, the last number of years of his life. Um, and he uh, eventually died of cholera um, in uh, 1851 um, at the age of 76. Anyway, uh, so, you know, kind of like a anticlimactic ending, I guess. Um, but however, like his his legacy, you know, as we talked about would go on to like inspire a lot of people and you know like the impressionist and abstract expressionist and pretty much like a lot of art (laughs) um and i would say um yeah like you know people like uh, there have been a lot people a lot more eccentric after after him so yeah, I had no idea Turner was this weird on many levels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um 
I didn't either, like before before learning about him. And yeah, there's just there's so much to to look at. Like I would encourage, like if you could see this show, like you know, please see it. It's it's really great. And um, but also just like yeah, looking into other Turner works beyond just the you know, ones that are well known. Um, Because for me, some of my favorite works are his watercolors. Like I almost just like wanted to spend this entire show showing you his watercolors. But um, there, yeah, there's just a lot more to, um, to explore and to, to uh, look at. Well, thank you so much for sharing that all with me today. And thanks everybody for listening. You can find our show notes at relay.fm slash pictorial, or you can find us on Twitter or Instagram at pictorialpod. You can also find me on Instagram or TikTok at aspiringrobotfm. And you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at articulationsv, and I am also on YouTube as articulations. And speaking of YouTube, we also have a YouTube channel, Pictorial Podcast, where we will upload video versions of our audio podcasts um, a few weeks or months sometimes if I'm late um, of after the audio version is out uh, so for this one you will be looking at some very lovely Turner paintings thanks for listening art enthusiasts